help us uh, to know exactly what uh, we should be able to, to offer them. So it helped us in designing the product. It also helped us to know the best um, uh, distribution channel uh, that works uh, with them. Because when we are doing research, we are also asking the needs and also how they want uh, a healthy product to, uh, to reach them. Uh, uh, number two, uh, it was, we used advertising. Uh, since there are other people who are enrolling on our product using uh, an SMS short code. So uh, we used social media uh, uh, like Facebook, um, other, other social medias like Twitter in advertising the, uh, the short code uh, so that people can register on their own and also to just to increase the visibility uh, uh, of the company and also uh, of the product. And also through the blending materials uh, 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 like t-shirts uh, that we are able to uh, uh, give to those communities that uh, we are piloting the product and also the communities that we are, uh, are scaling up the product. Uh, uh, and also uh, we used uh, uh, sales promotions uh, whereby we could give an incentive to those people who uh, uh, finish the registration and also uh, finish the, uh, the premium payment uh, uh, or, or where, whereby if anyone uh, has registered on the product and they have finished the payment we could give them for incentive like t-shirts uh, like wrappers and, and, and others as well and the, another one, uh, we used the awareness campaign where we could go to the rural communities and uh, do capacity building. We could gather people in one place, then we train them on how uh, insurance is or about in general. And then later on, uh, we, we sell them the, the product that we have. Thank you. So just um, um, uh, hello to the to the Southern team. Uh, I'm not sure if you prepared something for today. Uh, Jessica, apologies for uh, being late in joining. Sorry. Uh, but we uh, prepare hello. all this. Oh, I think I've been booted out. OK, so let me uh, share again. Yeah. Right. So, uh, yeah, uh, my apologies. I think I was booted out. Yeah, so the on awareness campaign, uh, uh, we would do the capacity building, uh, uh, making sure that uh, everyone have an understanding what issuance is all about in general, and then uh, later we uh, could uh, sell them the, the product. And also we could use the demonstration, demonstrating how uh, the product works. Uh, these are uh, some of the uh, marketing activities we used uh, in uh, 2023. Uh, uh, in regards to other marketing activities that we think uh, uh, our organization uh, uh, should pilot in light of the training, we are looking at uh, TV or radio campaigns. Uh, which we understand that can we can be able to reach uh, as many people as as we can, uh, and also it is uh, uh, it is almost in every district in in our country, and also the use of uh, our brand ambassadors, those uh, people who are well known uh, throughout the country, uh, so that they can we can use them uh, to disseminate. The, the message uh, or the product that uh, we are selling. Thank you so much. That's all uh, we have. Okay, thank you. 
okay. So, yes, Sadam. Jessica, we prepared the presentation along with Meadow Plus. Uh, so that presentation uh, is over, I suppose. Uh, yes. So, so yeah. So that was a joint uh, presentation, but uh, no, be, uh, because because Sadhan is an association of microfinance organizations, and we prepare. Uh, we whenever we design a product, we design along with the microfinance institutions and partners like Meadow Plus. So that is why we do not uh, reach out to the rural communities directly or market anything directly, but we uh, build the capacities of the microfinance institutions and our uh, stakeholders. So that is why we did it together. That is the reason, that is the logic behind uh, doing it together. Because right now we are designing a product together, keeping the rural uh, uh, market in view. Uh, that is why. That is the reason. And uh, am I audible? Yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Jessica. And apologies thank for being for... late. No worries. Thank you for for showing up. Um, thank you for the explanation. I'd like just to um, to give some back so some feedback to Mother Plus and Saddam. Uh, uh, not Saddam. And um, MIS. So on on. On Meadow Plus, what I see is that, I'm sorry, it's, it's going to sound a bit uh, harsh, but what I see from Meadow, but it's not unusual, the impression that Meadow Plus does marketing like you eat in a buffet, right? You go to these fancy hotels and they have a breakfast buffet and you have so many things and you end up trying a bit of everything. <laughs> like we could do this, we could do that. And uh, it's often uh, something that, you know, it happens with a lot of things. Um, you know, trying a lot of different things, uh, you know, that you've seen or that you have been exposed to or that you have tried or that you have learned to do. Um, in my experience, even in the normal um, you know, uh, let's say in a mature market for a mature product, uh, about 80% of these activities should be dropped. If you, uh, I don't know if you ever happen to have the time and the resources to do so, but you can really do a more detailed analysis for return on investment for each of these activities and you'll see that most of them um, are way too expensive for the leads that they bring you. Um, so I would really recommend to do a bit of cleanup and focus on uh, uh, the ones that you are that are um, where you certain that the return on investment in terms of marketing cost is attractive or at least uh, Stop doing the least attractive ones. But that's, that's you know, that's a generic advice for, for a mature market. As we have seen in the last training, in a non-mature market where, you know, people don't know or don't need or don't think they need or don't want your product, um, what may work in a ma mature market does not work at all. And this is why I really advised everyone to drop everything which could be considered as above the line, meaning leaflets, radio, uh, TV, paid social media. I mean, social media never is, you, if you do ever this return on investment, you'll see that social media is actually the most, the least effective and the most expensive channel of all when it's a very tar uh, untargeted. If you have very specific groups of users that you know are your specific audience and you have a direct access to them, social media will be a good tool to communicate with them, but otherwise social media and digital media in general is, to, is, a, is a terribly expensive and ineffective uh, 
roots. So all, all the things that are above the line typically should be dropped. And to the question last time, you know, saying, well, but below the line is very expensive and takes much time. Well, you can save first, you can save some money by stopping all the rest <laughs> uh, and kind of uh, reinvesting what, you know, the money you spend on what doesn't work to what works. Um, so that's, uh, that's uh, one thing. Also, I heard also from the MIS team, also to go back to the MIS team, I'm not sure if, uh, if my message was got well across because when you, when you, when you say what else could we do, you were mentioning above the line and it's really something we recommend not to do. So I would really urge the MIS team to, to have a look again at the slides and, and reflect on them. Uh, and also I, I've, uh, some of you use uh, these gifts no, or plan to use these kind of gifts, we give them a t-shirt, etc. So first, these are actually quite expensive to both produce, distribute. Second, you would be surprised by how little people wear them. And third, it doesn't drive sales, right? Um, so, or it doesn't drive loyalty, uh, etc. So again, this is like kind of one of these buffet ideas. We could do this, we could do that. We could give them key hangers, pants, <laughs> t-shirt. No, if you want to give them something, you have to give them something that is relevant to what you're selling. So a free head checkups at the end of which, you know, they can subscribe or they subscribe and you give them a free head checkups or they subscribe and um, if one year passes, uh, and they don't use their policy, give them a rebate uh, or give them a cashback, the value of the t-shirt. <laughs> uh, but you need to, whatever gift you do, you need to really make it embedded and relevant to the product you, you sell. Does it make sense? Yeah, I think that uh, makes sense. Yeah, I think we are also... Uh, uh, looking at what uh, you explained last time uh, in regards to the same, for example, you have uh, three to four people, you give them the product for free, and then you allow them to, to test it. And the, uh, those are some of the things we are uh, even trying to uh, to apply uh, uh, this year. So what you are saying is right. Uh, uh, it doesn't guarantee a sale. And the, if we can give them something that is related to, to the product, maybe it can add more value than just uh, a, a t-shirt. Yeah, sure. Okay, good. Any reaction from the Medoplast team? Anyone, Deepo? Deepak or anyone would like to respond on what feedbacks has been given by Jessica? Jessica, okay, go ahead. You were saying something, please. Sure, thanks. So, Jessica, um, thanks for the feedback and the most of the... Do you want to go on? So, uh, thanks for the feedback. And most of the items that we are doing currently are... Uh, actually very on the ground. So they do seem as a buffet of items that you're doing, but uh, uh, in our experience, we felt that this is what was working and we are doing it at a very minimalistic cost. But having said that, social media as well, uh, we've, we're targeting specific geographies. I mean, doing it only in the areas that we are doing. But yes, that's not that effective. I'm completely, I mean, I take that. So it's not that effective though, but very minimalistic social media or digital media penetration. It's all on the ground in terms of dealer boards and leafleting and campaigns on the ground in the villages at this point in time. More to in, in, you know ensure there's a recall value of Meadow Plus. Firstly, because we're a new new organization and not that old, because you want that recall value as well. Yeah, I uh, I hear you. I still believe that you could do half for the same result. Try <laughs> <laughs> leaflets are leaflets first pollute. 
Second, are useless. You can find a much, uh, you know, you can get, uh, um, you can really get much better value. I mean, you can really drop a lot of the things you do and you will mm -hmm. not see the difference or you can replace a lot of the, you can combine a lot of the things you do. But seriously, leaflets are a useless strategy. No matter, I, I don't know why people didn't stop doing leaflets. <laughs> since, uh, since there is so many studies worldwide that show that it's one of the most ineffective mm. uh, marketing channels. So I, I understand you want people to get to, you know, hear that there is something happening. Mm. Um, uh, but, um, you know, building brand awareness in your case is, uh, is not something that you necessarily need to invest into this at this stage, right? Because you don't have any competition. So brand awareness is great when you sell washing powder and there is five of different brands in the shop and you want somehow people to remember or to associate quicker to yours than any others besides of price. And so it's a very different. What I'm trying to say is that all these marketing tools are, many of them are ineffective most of the time. Many of them also are not suited for every time, every purpose. And I'm, I'm just saying in the markets you operate, it, the list gets shrinks even further. Um, so that's that's my recommendation, and you'll see you'll see that you can actually save a lot of money and perhaps refocus it a bit differently um, uh, for, for more effectiveness. So, so Jessica, would, would, would it be possible for you to just, you know, the items that, we've, that we do, we could share a list as well, just help uh -huh. us understand which ones, for example, leafletting. It definitely has a very short uh, memory span from anybody's perspective, you know, hardly a few seconds um, or maybe a few minutes, right? So uh, uh, I, I, I can bet you, I can bet you that no one decided to buy based on leaflet. Mm -hmm. Since the beginning of times, <laughs> I can put no, my in the fire yeah. for you to bet that. And mm -hmm. the only thing the leaflet might be useful, but it's a very expensive one, is to advertise that you're holding a health camp, for instance. Yeah, so that's where we actually use it the most, that uh, we're doing advertising the health camps. That's actually the area where we use it the most. Yes, but if it's just, you know, advertising an event, then perhaps mm -hmm. there's other ways to get... Uh, to get that done rather than a leaflet, really. Uh, uh, it's, it's very expensive. In that sense, perhaps, uh, uh, yeah. In, in that sense, perhaps you need to work more through partners or, I don't know, I thought that in India, a lot of things could be done through, you know, local, local authorities or the local community health worker or, and I find that's more, um, and Effective. It, mm -hmm. it allows you to build a human relationship and a human buying. And if the camp is good, whoever, whatever person of authority you use to kind of help bring in the people there, first, this person probably did a better selection than your leaflet. Second, you have probably paid that person a bit, so this person is going to be a bit, hopefully. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, it's a bit uh, helpful yeah. to you. Um, and uh, and third, you have built a relationship, right? So, yeah. uh, and it's human capital, and human to build human capital is really really important in the market. So, um, yeah, I think we did that didn't come out very. Uh, we didn't really put that uh, in the deck. But that's one of the first steps. And thanks for bringing that out, uh, mentioning that, Jessica. One of the first steps that we do is actually go and talk to the head of the, you know, keep it sim to, to simply put, head of the uh, village in some shape or form, you know, the legislatively or person who's taking care of that area and to have buy-in in terms of this is what we want to do uh, because we completely, completely agree with you that, you know, that buy-in is important. That's the first step that we do. I think we could have included that as well in our deck, but thank you for mentioning that. So what I was saying was maybe if we could share, if we could share the list of items that we do and the things that you think you feel are just not, should not be done, uh, you know, that would be very helpful. And we can give in more details in terms of, not in the deck, the deck was more like a rush through, but we can give details in terms of what do we do with that activity? And how does, yeah. how do we feel it's, you know, helping folks? And then they, we can work that out. But thank you so much for that.
Good, yeah. but I'm happy to have a quicker look if you send me a list of um, yes more details. I think we, you also need to distinguish for me the pure, you know, like uh, we're holding an event, come uh, activities. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah totally. Truly, you know, marketing uh, promotional marketing activities that you know that you perform to drive sales. So let me try to support uh, what Koshika and uh, Namo and uh, and uh, Ashish presented just for one minute. And uh, the overall theme of Middle Plus marketing has been relationship building marketing. It's purely from a human centric perspective. If you whatever the programs that they have mentioned, if you heard that uh, they mentioned about certain engagement programs with the patients or with rural community, they uh, the first one they mentioned was about branding, which means even a palm size sticker is being pasted on the palmets of the doors, hence keeping it very long lasting at hardly 50 pesa. So, I mean, uh, that was for branding. And the leafletting of what they were talking is very focused uh, approach when they have to do certain activities, like, for example, uh, talking about the symptoms related to stones and therefore uh, giving certain information and and also giving the list of the providers who may be able to do this. The, it, it is, of course, not for transaction. It does not converge, but it brings some attention when you are doing it at mass. And at an early stage, wherever you launch new markets, it brings some, just apart from attention, a bit of a trust because they see some um, pictures. But then, yes, this is not the major activity being done by the group. There are other uh, engagement programs which they highlighted was formation of a WhatsApp group of a village itself. So one meadow myth creates a WhatsApp group of fellow villagers and keep pushing various digital messages about the providers, about uh, you know ailments, so that the the recall value is higher. The sensitization keeps going on. Um, they mentioned about certain activities like they were mentioned in Hindi, but like baby shower, ailment specific outreach programs or a festival uh, uh, interaction. So they, they are again very focused health specific. Baby shower is when there is a, um, during a prenatal stage, uh, I mean the women's are, uh, I mean there are some worships as for the traditions and then there are some you know, some body checks are being done in association with that. So, I mean, these are like engagement and a very rooted activities. We, ATL is very less uh, time-consuming process. Uh, when I'm saying we don't spend too much of an effort in ATL uh, in the organization, that, but yes, it's a purely from a, a ground root level. So, just to bring the right perspective and then what they do is during certain festivals like Diwali, they engage the children and other family members of our channel called Medometra by getting some uh, drawing competition and other activities. So, yeah, but then we hear you, uh, Jessica, and we take that uh, points strongly and we will again sit internally to discuss that what can be the dropouts because few of them were like in a sequence of the engagement processes. Mm -hmm. but then, right. So, but we'll still surely evaluate and uh, do some yeah. brainstorming. Thank you for all that. Thank you for, for, for hearing me. But uh, now with some of the background, it makes more sense. Okay. Alors, share screen. Let's continue. Resume share. Yes. Hello. Can everyone see my screen? We can. Excellent. So we start with a quiz question. Um, this is actually a, a more. Um, Strategic question about you know how do you, about pricing, right? Uh, pricing of your product, and which ties directly into your business model. Uh, so, um, 
My, the, 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 the question is the following, you know, like, what kind of margins and what kind of, therefore, of price can you, do you need to pursue in low-income markets? Um, first one, um, you know, or the answer is, first option is like, uh, okay, we are dealing with poor people, we need to make it strive to make it affordable and that's why we need to charge very low prices but instead we're gonna aim for a large you know a scale play and at scale even with our low margins we will reach a sustainable growth so that's answer number one answer number two um, is very different is uh, saying uh, well it is very expensive to serve these markets probably way more expensive than to serve traditional markets because you need to invest into a lot of last mile infrastructure a lot into education a lot into product servicing and design etc and all these cost money and uh, given that we need to be sustainable to grow and serve even more people with even more value, then uh, we need to increase the cost. And uh, But it's fine given that people are able and willing to pay. Option number three is like, it's expensive, but people are not willing to pay. So we need to find other avenues to pay for the difference, like grants and subsidies to kind of subsidize our costs over time given it's expensive but people are not willing to pay I want to see some voting now in the chat one two or three Mirage was fastest William was second fastest. Okay. We have four or five votes now. A few more, please. Just to tell me you're around. Koshika so voted just before me. Sorry? You just voted for me, but it's fine. <laughs> Not really. Hello, I'm missing blessings. Ashish, <laughs> Madalizo, Emma, uh, Robert, Daziona. Missing quite a few MIS people. Are you still on the line? William, are you all alone? Oh, I'm not alone. Uh, there is, there is uh, uh, blessings. There is uh, uh, Madaliso. You You're the only one who voted. There is Robert. Uh, Wait, wait, wait for my vote soon. In just a matter of seconds. Thank you for waking up, Robert. <laughs> We're going to wait a bit more that people wake up. Blessing could wake up too. Oh, yes, Robert, thank you.
William, do you want to nudge uh, your colleagues? Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm doing that. Uh, I think they'll, they'll be able to, to, to vote uh, right now. Thank you. Thank you, Blessing. So we have, who voted number three? Who is user? We have somebody called user. Uh, it's me, Edward. Edward, you are in the minority. Explain why. Uh, the reason why I've picked uh, three, it's because the, uh, the target group or the segment that we are focusing on, uh, basically at times they don't have the capacity to buy the products that we're selling there. So I think partnerships with the organizations or individuals that can be able to provide uh, premium assistance to these particular groups in the form of grant, uh, in the form of uh, uh, premium contribution to a certain percentage whereby uh, the remainder should be able to be paid by the, uh, by the subscribing clients. So, I think uh, as one way of uh, distributing the product through grants, it's ideal in order to, to have a social and financial impact on those particular people you're targeting. So your answer is like, if there is free money, why not use it? Is that it? Uh, it's not free money per se, because they will also be contributing a certain portion of the premium. Okay, then we had Robert, who, also, who said one. Robert, you seem to be in disagreement with your colleague. Explain us why. Yeah, so, so basically, I think he, it's, it's important to have diverse views so that you also learn from what others are thinking. But on my side, I um, take an example of um, our product here, uh, Apwenzi. So, so I think he, we believe that uh, although they are lower margins, but the, um, the big volumes uh, guarantee business Plus, the you know, there is uh, a lot of uh, uh, the the lower end customer or the mass market. You know, there there is a lot of numbers. So, uh, capitalize on the uh, big numbers to make sure that we get um, uh, better margins in the long run. Okay, okay. And does somebody from Meta Plus want to speak? Hello. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, Jessica, we have selected one as a answer of this question, just because when we talk of the bottom of pyramid, affordability and the price sensitivity is there in the market. And the um, when it comes to uh, price affordability and the product affordability, obviously the price plays a very important and prominent uh, role onto this. To get the better margin, a distributor can distributor should keep the margin lower so that product can be affordable to uh, the villagers, and uh, so subsequently distributor can get the uh, uh, bigger volumes as well. So uh, to get the big volumes, obviously we have um, the distributor needs to keep the margin lower at a lower side so that products can be uh, can be. Um, made available, very affordable, and uh, and price affordable also. So just because of this, uh, 
scenario, uh, we have selected one as answer. Okay, okay. I beg to disagree with everybody on this one, and I'm going to show you. Uh, I'm going to show you why. Great, so interesting. <laughs> <laughs> So the right answer, in my view, is the one that nobody chose, is answer number two. And I'm going to try to explain you a bit why. Um, first is that, I, I hope everybody agrees, is that working, I, I, it was also the, the, you know, the, the remark of Sadan last time, saying this is incredibly expensive. Right? And then... Uh, how do we explain that to investors and donors, right? So I hope we all agree it's ex incredibly expensive to serve these markets. And here we have actually um, a, a range of the typical gross margins that organizations serving these markets register when they are sustainable or have to register to get sustainable. So you, as you can see, it ranges from 25 to 40%. So I'm not sure if somebody has their gross margin numbers top of mind. Does anyone in the room know it? Yeah, yeah. I, I think uh, no, absolutely in sync of what you are saying. Because we were, uh, I was thinking it from a very different perspective at our ground root level. But then we also see that we are also like a distributor only. And therefore... Therefore, uh, undoubtedly, the cost of serving these markets are exceptionally high. And therefore, it requires a higher margin in order for sustainability for the distributor, uh, without a doubt. So we also as uh, earn margins, gross margins between 25 to 30% currently. Mm. Well, absolutely right. So while we, we practice this, but probably we got distracted somewhere in the question. <laughs> in alignment of what you are saying, uh, Jessica, hundred percent in alignment. And what uh, what bothers me with uh, answer one, which is like we will uh, square the circle. Do you know this? It's a French expression. We will square, square the circle. Um, um, only when we scale, right? Saying you know. Even though our margins are insufficient and our overhead is large, if we kind of, the day we will reach, you know, one million users or so many, so many groups, we will break even. And believe it or not, but it's a story that I keep hearing and I never see happening. Break even is always three years out, <laughs> always, no matter what. And it's always at, you know, at a, at, a, at a scale point that is very difficult to achieve. And whenever a venture reaches the scale point that they had thought would be the break-even scale point, believe it or not, their costs are gone up. So this, this, the, the break-even point had moved further down the line because as you scale, the challenges become of another nature. And to address these challenges, your cost base grows, right? The complexity grows. You need to invest into different teams, different people, different processes, um, it, uh, you know, more security, more after sales, more this, more that. And so, um, the scale story is a very elusive one. And there is very few people who, who crack the scale story, actually. And what I'm trying to say is that it, uh, it leaves you only with option two or three, meaning you charge these high margins and you try to be break-even from day one or close to day one. And uh, yes, it's a, it feels a bit scary at the beginning and hard, and that's why a lot of people are looking for grants at that stage. But I, I often, I recommended clients to increase the price, 
to a level that would be closer to break even and see what happens. Um, and uh, very often, I'm not saying in every case, but very often the, um, these ventures were surprised that sales did not go down. You know, the assumption is that if we increase this, the price, sales will go down. Most of the cases, it doesn't happen. It's some kind of preconceived notion that people would would be able or willing to pay the price you give them, but not if you, you know, if you would increase it, you know, sales would drop. Well, I've seen people double their price and sales would not move. I'm not sure why there is many, uh, I mean, I'm not sure about the explanation about that, but I do think that if people want to buy a product and if it's good, they will find the money, especially if you provide them some kind of, you know, solution to pay because uh, it, it, sometimes the problem is less uh, ability or willingness to pay. It's just a cash at hand story, right? They don't have the cash right now. Um, but um, when, people are, when people are convinced they want and need your product, whether it costs $1 or $2 will not move the needle. Or whether you price it too, um, actually, and it goes in both directions, right? Some people are, sometimes people are just striving to bring their, their cost down, right? And their price down, and they think it will drive sales. It doesn't happen. You start at two dollars, and then you you price you go so to through so much length to bring it to one eighty, which is you know <laughs> a ten percent reduction in price, which is huge for you and can, as a company, right? Because it you know it endangers your profitability, and it you know you invest so much in bringing the price down, but it doesn't drive your sales up, right? Uh, because I don't think you don't, you, what people need to realize is that they don't operate in a market that where people have pricing references, right? You're not selling washing powder. It's not like the, you know, the, the washing powder or the soap and the ongoing price is uh, 30 cents and then suddenly your product, which is a decent product that compares well, to competition and you price your product 20 cents instead of 30. Yes, you're gonna drive sales, right? Because you just undercut competition. And while people, more, most people think your product is okay, they can save five cents, they will buy it. But you, you're not in the washing powder market. People have very little reference points for how much your product should cost. Actually, they have none, right? And um, a few dollars, if you provide value, will not move the needle. So I'm always recommending my clients, price your product as close as possible to profitability. Without compromise. Bringing it down doesn't drive sales much or at all. And while bringing up it up might result in a little less sales, but much better profitability, which will allow you to develop a better product, a better value proposition, more convincing marketing, and more solid after sales. And this is all value that ultimately translates into more sales. Right, and 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 I think a lot of people also price low out of the belief that, you know, these are poor people, we can't exploit them. Well, you know, it's expensive to be poor. Poor people will pay what, you know, it's very famously documented, the poverty tax. You're poor, you pay more than rich people proportionally. It is these markets, and you, at least you're trying to serve these markets with a product that brings value and that solves a problem. And it is expensive to do it. You're not doing charity, right? 
So I, I really advise you for whoever has not been breaking even with their product to recon reconsider your pricing strategy. And perhaps now that you will have, uh, you know, especially for, for Metaplus, that you will have a financing solution, try to, well, it's not necessarily uh, for your product per se, but it could be embedded. Um, the, especially if you have a financing solution for your product, try to increase the price and see what happens. Feels very bold and scary, but try. Any thoughts or questions? I will request uh, the team members to really get into debate if they have any thoughts. I'm sorry, could Jessica, I really want this point is very, very interesting point and I think all of us should be on the same page on the thought process of driving profitability for sustainability. I always, so perhaps also another thought that um, when I touch this, pro, uh, and I would love to have the, the MIS team also react, but you know, there is a, there is something that is way more unfair and less impactful than increasing prices, in my view. And it is to stay small. If you stay small, because you cannot grow, because you're too cheap to pay for yourself or for, to pay for your operations and, you know, your own growth, what are you doing? You're just remaining small. What does it mean remaining small? You're depriving hundreds of thousands of users from your solution. Yeah. And that's way worse, in my view, than having and then charging a slightly higher price. If you truly provide value the way we were describing it at the beginning of the training, if really people get richer from using your product than poorer, it is totally okay you capture part of that value. Yeah, I think they are, they are tying in very strongly. Very, very good connection, Jessica, you created that people are becoming richer by using our product line or the services. Absolutely. And then we need to charge for that as well. It's, you, you can charge. Uh, that always I'm saying all begins with the value you create. If you create $5 in value, and you need to be very conservative about how you compute value, you know. but if you create, let's say, in average, $5 in value for your user, for each user, then you have the right to ask two back. It still makes them $3 more rich. <laughs> Actually, you have the right to ask them four back. You, st you still make them $1 more rich. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but at least with these two, three, four dollars extra, you will be able to grow, meaning you will address the fundamental problem, which is an inequity problem, the ones who have and the ones who have not. And as long as you remain small, you are, uh, you are unequitable. You provide your solution to too few people. And that's way worse than not sharing as much value as possible with them. Right? So I, I really, I would really like also, I'm, I'm not sure if Gift is on the call today. Is Gift on the call today or not at all? Uh, no, he's not, uh, but uh, he had an, uh, had another meeting, but uh, I think he's winding up. Uh, he may be able to join us shortly. But is there, I, I really hope that the rest of the team can bring him, up, bring him up on this important question, right? Because I think uh, the price yes. of your... I think, uh, I, think I will start. Uh, just need, uh, uh, because this is an interesting uh, topic uh, in, in regards to uh, the product that uh, 
we are selling. So uh, uh, I had we, we had an experience where uh, before we priced the product that we were we, 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 we are selling now, we did a market research and then uh, we had um, uh, three uh, samples of product. So we brought those products to uh, to the customers and we are asking them question if the product looks like this, how much can you pay? If it looks like this, how much can you pay? Now, uh, when we analyzed uh, the data, it was found out that um, what we are proposing in the first place uh, that will help us to uh, generate revenue and to, uh, to retain uh, uh, the cost, we found out that uh, what the customer suggested, it was way more uh, lower than the one that uh, we decided when we did uh, all the, the analysis. So my question is, in that case, uh, since it is the same customers who have given you what they think they can afford, if you add the price and then it become expensive, uh, will it not affect the uh, 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 the customer uh, 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 power when it comes to, to purchasing the product? I just wanted to, to understand. That's why I've, I've brought to you this uh, scenario whereby we have our actual price, which we think it will help us, and it will be sustainable if uh, we price in that way. But you you have also what the uh, the customer wants, what the customers are expecting uh, in terms of price. So in that case, uh, what can you advise? But may, let me ask you a question. What did you end up doing as pricing? The, the one you you were planning to do or the one they told you they were willing to pay? What was the conclusion of this exercise? Come again. And my question to you is like, what was the conclusion? So you had the pricing that you were planning to do and you had the pricing that the, the, your customers said they were willing to pay. Which one did yeah, you so do what in we, the end? So, all right. So what we did is uh, we met along the way. We did not talk what the customer wants not even what we uh, proposed in the first place, but we met uh, in the long way, uh, whereby uh, we met in the middle uh, uh, during the, uh, the pricing. So basically what we did is, if the customer says they can afford two watcher and our actual was uh, $2, if our actual was $5, then we met in the middle to say, okay, then let's put it at, uh, at $3. So now they are not, they, they are not unhappy, your customers are unhappy and you are unprofitable. Is yes, that, so, sorry. yes, so, yes, so you, you made, you still met the customer. They said, no, no, this one is too expensive. But at the same time, if we bring it lower to what the customer wants, they will not be profitable. Yeah, so I really think, seriously, uh, it was this William, William, uh, I, um, the, if you ask a poor customer, how much are you ready to pay for a product you never thought about and you never thought you wanted or needed, I tell you, you're going to get a very low number. Yes, I agree. I, if you ask any poor customer, do you find these expensive? No matter what the article is, what will they answer? Yep. Yes, it's expensive, it's expensive, it's expensive, expensive. right? Me, Do they ever me. say yeah. that the product is cheap? No, never. Never, right? When you ask yeah. them, when you ask them, what could we do better for you? What do they ask always? Give discounts. Give discounts, yes. <laughs> So, <laughs> yeah. And so, whether you start from ten dollars or two dollars, will you get a different answer? No, they always no, want to no. They always say they don't have enough cash, right? Yes. <laughs> right. Even if you give them the most derpy cheap, 
impossible to sustain price. Will they complain about it? Yeah, I agree. Will they say they don't have money? No. What? No. If you give them at, at whatever price, if you are able to prove that value, they will not complain if they are able to find that value. Ah, uh, yes, exactly. You need to do value-based pricing, right? You need, they need to understand the value. But even so, right, even so, they always complain it could be cheaper because, hey, you know, they have so little cash at hand at any point of time. It's really difficult to part with it, right? What I'm trying to say, William, is that there is no way to fight that fight the way you do. You need to focus on the value you bring them. If they are convinced of the value you yes, bring, yes, I, I I understand that. Right, and you know, like you will have the same yes, discussion. I... You will have the same discussion about Wednesday, mm -hmm. whether you price it at two, three, four, or five dollars. You will have the exact same discussion. And what I'm trying to tell you is that if you would have priced your Wednesday product at higher. I am 95% sure that you would have sold the same way. Why? Because they don't have a reference point. So Jessica, there is some differencing thought which is coming into my mind. Just wanted to share. Um, I don't hear you so well. Can you speak closer to the... Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, there are few uh, thoughts which are coming into my mind. Just wanted to share it uh, with you. Uh -huh. So, uh, see, the cheaper product and the affordable products are two different products, right? What we are seeing and what we are actually experiencing, ex experiencing is that you have to make your product affordable in order to get the perceived value of the product to the customer. Right. So affordable, affordable price actually plays a very important role in dealing with a bottom of pyramid uh, target audience. So what I think is going by the uh, logic which you are actually uh, putting up here is keeping your price a bit higher will not make any difference. I do agree. But Yes, I also feel that you have to place your pricing in order to get the um, affordable uh, price. Means there are a lot of challenges which needs to be dealt with, like your competitions, like the perceived value which is already existing in the market. So these all there may be uh, uh, one or more uh, one two uh, maybe uh, three four more reasons to get the pricing uh, at an affordable uh, rate so what i am saying ki you have to keep your pricing affordable whenever you are working in bottom of pyramid because that actually plays a very uh, important role for making the dis, uh, buyer's decision because a lot of decisions are based on the uh, pricing in this target audience so you have to keep your uh, keep the pricing bit uh, affordable so that perceived value and the uh, the buyer decisions can be uh, made uh, through this so, yeah i would like to you know i would like you to tell me what is affordable Affordable first, being, you know, you and I sitting from a privileged background, what we call affordable is, uh, is a very uh, vague notion, right? But um, yes, we can look at it, you know, from a hard numbers point of view, right? You can try to figure out how much do they actually earn cash. Very difficult thing to figure out, by the way, right? Because nobody will tell you or... <laughs> but let's assume you get to the bottom of the truth and you figure out how much your typical household has cash, you know, over one year. We, we both know that, you know, cash movements for poor people, especially in rural areas, go up and down, right? But let's say, let's take an average per year, right? And then you look at, 
what percentage of that amount can you reasonably claim, right? If you want to really start from their situation, can you reasonably claim once they have paid for everything that is essential, hopefully, you know, food, some, you know, some, some, some basic necessities, hopefully the kids schooling, etc. <clears throat> and then you can see, you know, how much of the, in Switzerland, you know how much of uh, our income goes into insurance? So that you know, right? 15% of our income goes into basic insurance. 50. So, um, uh, you know, like everything is a bit, uh, but you can try to look at their high number. What I'm trying to say is that poor people are value buyers. They're really value buyers. So for, for a lot of things that, you know, the, you know the, the things that they need, the basic necessity, they will really compare and try to get the cheapest, except for the things that matter right or for the things where they're really looking for a specific thing but poor people can also buy a tv whether the tv was the best uh, next thing they need to buy we could argue right they also you know they could go they could forego kids education to buy other things that you know you and i could think you know i don't see the point right but you know it's all about the perceived value so your job is to Build that perceived value, given because price cannot be the reference point in your case, and it is not. You know, can they really compare the price of your insurance or your product in terms of bags of rice? Is this the right compar comparison? No, you need to help them build a, a value comp uh, comparison, right? This is how much it costs for how much I get. And yes, you could, you could argue that, yes, perhaps we cannot ask 20% of their income to pay for our product. This is, you know, this is not doable. But don't forget, you know, it's not 20% of their income if you make them richer. So I'm just saying this, uh, you know, like, when people tell you that they find it expensive, they don't tell you they don't have the cash. They tell you they don't see the value. They tell you they don't trust that your product will bring them the value that you tell them it will. They tell you a lot of things, but they for sure don't tell you they don't have the cash. Right, so I would uh, I would really urge you to also for Benzi, right? If you can talk to a gift, you know, perhaps you do geographical based expansion. Try to convince gift William to do a pilot for me, just to humor me, right? Go into a new, open a new area, and hopefully not too far from where you operate, so we have similar conditions in terms of income and profile of users, but not too close because obviously people would be upset if you charge them more than the neighbors, right? And do a pilot whereby you charge, you know, higher, 20, 30, 40% higher than what you charge now. And try to see if you have less sales over time. I bet not. It'll be equally hard, but at the end of the day, you I will mean, Ah, okay. For for me, I think uh, it's an eye opener, and uh, I've enjoyed the uh, the discussion because the challenge is always: uh, Are you falling for what the uh, customer wants or what the customer is expecting? But now, from my ex explanation, I've I've gotten an insight. The customer would never. Uh, say this is enough. I uh, always look for for the less, but and also looking at uh, the market segment that we have in here in our country, 
is that almost 80% of the population they are uh, in the uh, rural based and they are in the uh, they are low income earners and sometimes it is uh, so hard when it comes to the pricing of the product uh, looking at uh, what uh, they make because they live below $1 uh, a, a day so you are like if we, we structure this product like this will they be able to, to to afford it but now through the explanation i think now i've been uh, enlightened on on how best uh, you can price the product so that it can be profitable at the same time uh, affordable to, uh, to to the customer thank you welcome don't forget you're not you're not making them poorer right you're making them richer so it's not that you're eating it at first. The one dollar per day is a fallacy, right? But anyway, we're not going to go into that. But the, um, if you truly make them richer, it's okay to ask for a part of that value back. It's not that you eat into the one dollar a day and they will. If you truly make them richer, if you price a bit more, then you just make them a little less rich. But they're still becoming richer thanks to you. You see what I'm trying to say? Yes, 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 I understand. Let me give you, I don't know if I, I, I don't want to take too much time. This is an important point. I, in my previous life, I was working for capitalists. Uh, so I for the capitalistic world. And uh, I worked for a consulting company that perhaps some of you have heard of. I worked for McKinsey. It's a very famous consulting firm, very expensive. Many years ago when I was working them, for them, and it was many, many years ago, um, do you want to know how much my daily fee was? It's not that I'm bragging. I'm just get, trying to give you an example. You, give me a wild day, give me a wild guess as for what my daily fee was. How much was it? You give, give me give me give me a guess, William. <laughs> maybe <laughs> maybe twenty thousand. Uh, I I mean five thousand dollars in a month. <laughs> in a month? Or, no, I'm asking about the day. We were charging per day, not per month. So maybe around uh, four hundred dollars a, a man power. Four hundred a day. Four, five, yeah, four to five hundred a day. Mm. Uh, just maybe two hundred dollar mm. per any, day. Any more votes in the room? Uh, <laughs> just hold on. Let me let me just convert it. Give me a second. <laughs> I don't want you to do back up the envelope. Oh, no, no. But be, I was based in Zurich, so be, I don't know the prices in India. Yeah, I was yeah, yeah. Based it, in had, uh, it should be at least $2,000 a day. Okay. It should be about $2,000 a day. My apologies, I didn't calculate. Uh, okay. No, I mean, because you, you have said it many it years ago, maybe probably $100 a day. Ah, William, you, you're, so, you're so naive. It's sweet to see. No, I was, we were, uh, of course, I didn't see the money, but what the clients were paying for people with my profile was six to seven thousand dollars a day. Oh, wow. Yeah, shocking. <laughs> and, wow. Wow. Yeah. A team. And, that, and that's a long time ago. How many years ago? Oh, at least 15, 16, 17 mm. years ago. That's a European rate, but what I told you was an Indian rate. <laughs> <laughs> I have hired McKinsey's in my life, so from that perspective, I was sharing. <laughs> so an average team, a small team, would cost one million a month. Yeah. Can you imagine? And believe it or not, we were finding clients who were ready to pay that kind of money. It, it was, of course, big clients. But do you think these clients were ready to throw money through the window? No. no. How were we selling a project of one million a month? Well, we were telling them we will help you save 50 million. When you help a client save 50 million and you tell them the bill is gonna be three million, does the client love you? 
they still think it's an incredibly good deal, right? Yeah. We could have, I probably have charged double. It's just that would have been a bit of a big search. But technically, theoretically, we could have charged double. Right? But as a rule of thumb, yeah. As a rule of thumb, we were always taking more or less one third of the value we created. Half, half feels too aggressive, right? But one third feels fair. Well, that's for people who do a lot of math and, you know, typically your markets are not so sophisticated to deal with such numbers. But what I'm trying to tell you is that you're not making your clients poor, you're making them richer. It is fine to capture some of the value you created for them. That's why the first exercise in the whole deck was that compute me the value, the tangible value you can systematically claim that you create for each single of your clients in ways that are tangible or not. If you can, and find a way for you to describe that value to them in a way that they believe in it and trust that they will realize it. And build, if you cannot do that, build your whole marketing strategy around creating, making that value tangible and trustable for them. If you have, that's your number one marketing objective. Once you have done that, pricing is much simpler. Wow, thank you. I think that is, uh, is an eye opener. And uh, yeah, I think uh, the, the, the level of understanding is changing now. <laughs> Okay, that's good. Then I hope you can convey that to Gift because I, I, this is really something I wanted to discuss with him. Okay, let's continue. We have a very cool chapter ahead now. So let's dive into it. Um, this is about Salesforce. So we're going to move away from marketing topics to Salesforce topics, right? Um, and a lot of people, uh, I think this is, uh, you know, for Medo Plus a topic now, very hot, but also for, for MIS, uh, because you are also doing a lot of, uh, you know, you're trying a lot of things to, to sell a Venzi. But basically, a lot of people typically asking me, what kind of salespeople, how do I need to, what kind of salespeople, and how do I need to organize my sales force? do I need for my product, right? And usually people try, it's just like the buffet in the morning breakfast. A lot, people try a lot of things <laughs> and see which one tastes good, right? <laughs> so there's four options. To distribute, you know, the, the kind of products that you are distributing. What kind of sales force do you need? Answer number one, please, everyone wake up your colleagues who are sleeping or doing something else so we can get the answer. The answer number one, you need to hire local people because, uh, you know, they know the neighbors, they know the village, they can, you know, talk more trustfully, etc. Then answer number two, no, we need to hire professional salespeople because they know how to get the job done and uh, only them can deliver the kind of pitch that uh, we need them to deliver. We have a complex product that needs to be explained well. And you just make them mobile so that they can reach out as many people as possible. Answer number three. Oh, it's very difficult. Answer number three is like, uh, it's very difficult to satisfy salespeople. They never make enough money and they end up leaving. So the best way to kind of manage these is to make them sell multiple products, not only ours, right? Or piggyback people who sell other products, you know, <clears throat> um, mobile money agents or, you know, like, so somehow selling our product comes on top of another activity, uh, you know, and it's kind of top up money. Uh, fourth, uh, 
Fourth is like, it's a more of an answer, which is it depends. Each product is so different. And so we need different sales force. Fourth is really an option that is more relevant for companies that sell a, a broader range of products, which is not necessarily you kids. Okay, who wants to vote? I'm curious to see who is going to be the first one now. Uh, hello. Two, one, one. Robert is fully awake this time. Eh? Of course, I am now. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see. People of Mega Plus are sleeping this time. No, it's okay. Allez, a bit more vote, please. We are missing. Koshika keeps sending to me. Ah. We're still missing somebody who never votes in the Arizona. She must he or me it must not be here. And then we had somebody oh, yes. Okay, so we have everybody converging towards let me see. Everybody wants one except Niraj. So Niraj, please defend yourself. Niraj, why did you choose two? Yeah. So the reason is because there is a common uh, common aspect between first and two. There was a close fight in, in able to pick up the person, but then because both the people are able to over, overcome the trust issue. More importantly, the second person is very effective because this person is willing to deliver, or has an ability to deliver a convincing pitch about the product and the services. Probably using certain aids or demonstration so that the trust keeps building. A convincing person, I can also see, has an ability to uh, grow up in times to come as well. Okay, so you're know, saying both of them can sell, but at least one is working more effectively. Um, anyone who, who voted one who wants to de defend number one? Yeah, so according to me, I feel that local person uh, are well aware of, about their uh, society uh, area and, and the people behavior and as well uh, their buying capacity. So uh, that's why I choose uh, local people for the sales better. Uh, local people can be better sales force. Okay. Thank well, you. you need to defend that a bit better. It's not convincing. Is it maybe uh, for uh, for me, maybe I, I would say uh, local people. Uh, when we are engaging local people, number one is that they are well known in that uh, territory, and the, uh, we are now on local people. We are not just looking at uh, everyone. Uh, for example, I'll give an example. When we were doing a pilot of our product, uh, we engaged the uh, traditional authority. So he's like the overall person, and uh, his word uh, is a command. And uh, now when people see that uh, the one who is in charge of the territory is aware of us, they are able to trust in, the, uh, in your product because they know uh, that uh, if the uh, the traditional authority is aware, then it has it should have been. Uh, it is that th they have done a due diligence uh, uh, of the institution. So uh, most people we gained the trust from most people because they knew that uh, we are working 
uh, hand in hand with the uh, with the traditional authority. So yeah, local people basically they have some value when it comes to trust issues because when you are going in a territory where you are not been where you have not been there before, people may not trust you. They may think like you are scammers or you you just want to take their money. But when it is coming from someone uh, who is uh, in the authority in that uh, location, uh, it's able to uh, build a trust. Okay, okay. Now, uh, yeah, I, think, I, I think just also to spice up what uh, William has said, um, it's, it, it's even more important on uh, institutions like us selling um, an intangible product um, because uh, we... If we just go or, or... I lost you. Hello? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so, so it's 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 very important, especially in our case where we are selling an intangible product. Yeah. So we go and uh, ask them to pay for a product that they they don't have uh, at hand. And then uh, one or two days later, we are not there. So probably. Um, that sale weren't complete. So with the presence of the uh, local uh, sales representation, it 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 will really it will it, it will really help to enhance trust and uh, the uptake of the product. So it's very important uh, to have the involvement or the inclusion of the local sales force in the uh, uh, sales team uh, uh, to, to 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 make sure that the numbers are driven up. Okay, you know, like, given that we're getting to the end of the training, the quizzes are becoming a bit more complicated, right? So this was a quiz question that, were, that is tricky. So actually the right answer is not in the list. I'm sorry. <laughs> so the right answer is it depends. Let me show you. Now I'm going to use some, uh, some charts that... Uh, that you might find a bit complicated, but bear with me because these are some of the most insightful slides in the deck. First slide is sales productivity. What is sales productivity? Is how much a salesperson sell in average worth of value per year. Right? So sales, we can see here that we have, we had what, 25 or more organizations and we looked at the sales productivity of their sales people, meaning how much sales value one salesperson would in average sell per year. And you can see a huge variation, right? In some organization, the average salesperson would sell 1,000 worth of product per year. And in some other organizations, one salesperson would sell 1,028,000 ,000 worth of product every year. So, and I, I would love that you would know your numbers. I don't know what these are, you know, as sales and marketing people, sales productivity is one of the ratios that would really, really, you know, urge you to know and monitor. But I'm wondering where you salespeople stand. Right. And um, in general, but this is a deck that is a bit, a few years old, but I, I find it, it still surprisingly works well. Uh, two weeks ago, I was giving this training and actually all the numbers were working still. Uh, but it was for organizations in East Africa. Um, if your average sales person sells less than $20,000 in a year, then you have a problem. This is why we, you have this threshold line around 20,000 per year per sales person on the chart. So I don't know if anyone knows the number by heart. How does the 20,000 threshold feel like? Do you have a problem because you're below it or not? I 
I guess no one knows the number. A pity, because you should. Okay, but no, what? Uh, huh? For us, uh, at least at our side, it is slightly higher. So the average sits at about 30,000. Oh, that's not bad at all. Well done. Well done. But so... Like this, is, this, is, this is the sales value and not the gross margin. Yeah, yeah so we agree. Sales, sales value. Sales. Yeah. So sales value is good. If you're above the 20,000, at least the GDEC was made 10 years ago. So, but, uh, so there was inflation and all, but I think you're good. I'm not sure about MIS. Anyway, what we see also is that it's very difficult to be above the threshold with part-time salespeople. Oh, yes. Uh, you yeah. That's true. Oh. So, in general, we tell people, don't try with part-time. Don't try with people for whom this is a side activity. Because then these people will really struggle to reach a threshold. Why is this threshold important? Let's look into it. On the left, sorry again, it's full of graphs, but it's quite really interesting. Um, on the left hand side is the same graph, right? The sales productivity per salesperson. On the right hand side is how much they are getting paid. All right, so, and you can see that the magic bar is cutting around. 2,000 per year. Right? Anything below 2,000 remuneration does not work well. Of course you can pay more. Some organizations do pay more. But uh, anything below 2000 a year does not work well. And obviously all these needs to hold each other, right? Given the kind of margins that you guys typically have, it is difficult for you to pay a salesperson more than 10% commission on the value of the product, right? More than that gets very, very tricky for profitability, right? Ideally, it should be less than that. I mean, the, the organization that was paying 2,500 in sales value for people who were hard selling 128,000, I mean, these guys, you know, hit the jackpot. <laughs> but uh, let's say at the minimum, you should be able to pay, and that's, you know, the minimum, 10%. Of the value they sell because you still have all your other costs to factor in right so all that and below 2000 a year you can see that these sales people start leaving it's not enough it's too hard and it's not enough so you somehow don't keep them motivated and you don't give them a salary that is competitive enough for them not to start doing something else so all these parameters need to hold each other. But as we see, the point is to make sure that they sell at least $20,000 worth of value of goods in a year. And thanks to that, you will be able to pay them at least 2000 or 10% to keep them happy and retain them. But also, you know, ask that they deliver. So... You're asking, what has all this to do with the Salesforce organization? I'm coming there. Bear with me and you stop me if you don't understand how we build these graphs. Basically, these graphs, the dots, is exactly the same picture, but differently. The dots are the organizations. So we had uh, 25 organizations that we benchmarked in the previous slide. And the dots are, each dot is one organization, one venture, if you want. 
And uh, the bar, the, uh, the yellow bar that was in the previous chart is also in this chart. You know, is the $20 sales per salesperson per year. Anything that is on top, top right side of the bar, it's organizations that manage to have more than 20,000 of sales per salesperson per year. And anything that is under, under the left side of this bar is organizations who fail to reach that threshold. And you can see that there is dots that fail that are below this bar and those that are above this bar, above the bar, successful ones, below the bar, unsuccessful ones. <clears throat> now, if we try to cluster these people, you can see, if, if, let me explain the graph and then I will explain the cluster. The graph on the y-axis, you have the number of clients that each salesperson successfully sells to in a year. So it ranges from a few dozens to a few thousands. Right. And on the x-axis is the price, is how much the, the client pays. You can see it ranges from a few dollars to a thousand dollar plus because very different types of products, very cheap products, very expensive products. Now, based on that, you can see that there is basically four clusters. I'm sorry, the gray, the gray, uh, the gray cluster is a bit misplaced, but basically you can see that there is four clusters uh, of four models, four sales force models um, coming together. The first one, I call it, is the bottom right corner. I call it the farmer model. <clears throat> it's basically the, the organizations that sell very expensive products, so in the hundreds or in the thousands, to few people, right? So they have only a few hundred customers a day to whom they sell very expensive products. At the other end, up top corner, you have the hunting model, right? Which is basically selling very low tickets, very low priced products, very, you know, low value products or low price products to thousands of people, right? So again, you can make the 20,000 in sales either by selling big tickets to few people or small tickets to many people. So you have the hunter and the farmer model. We know that both these models are successful because in both cases, these organizations manage to be above the yellow line. You have a third successful model, which is the blue one, uh, which we call shifting cultivation. In, a, in an African context, we call it the pastoralist model. Basically, it is a, 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 a semi-mobile model, right? Your salespeople go into an area, they stay in an area for a period of time, and once you, know, once, uh, you reach a certain level of saturation in that area, meaning your sales slow down, uh, then you move to the next area, All right? And you start again to the next area, and perhaps you go through five, six, seven areas before starting again in number one, hoping that word of mouth and you know uh, will have picked up, and you, there is you know you can sell to another wave of people in area one, and then you continue with two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then you start again, and each time you build up your penetration through waves in different areas. And then there is a model that does not work, which we call the gardening model, which is the purple one. Right? You can see the gardening model is people who sell little amounts 
I mean, little high services or products that are low priced to just a few hundreds of people. And we know that, but of course, if you sell low to a few people, then you're not going to reach the 20,000 sales bar. Now, you need very different sales profiles depending on which, depending on what your product costs and or how you price your product and to how many people you need to sell it to. This is why the answer to this quiz, it depends. The profile of your salespeople depends massively in which bucket you are. If your product is very expensive, meaning you fall into the farmer model, yes, you need to take local people. You need to choose them so, so well because you need to choose really local people who are driven by passion, by trust, who have an incredibly high reputation in the village, who really fell in love with your product. And they will not sell many products every day but they will manage to close very expensive sales because of the trust and reputation and proximity and cloud they have in their communities. And it will take them weeks or perhaps months to close a sale, but these are the kind of sales profile you need if you are in the farming cluster. Now you guys are mostly in the hunter model, right? You need to sell a lot of your products because in general, they are low priced. You need to sell in the thousands of them to be above the bar. And now you need hunters. You cannot take farmers. Who are hunters? Hunters are professional salespeople. They are people who are, who are on a motorbike and who are able to reach out and sell convincingly small amounts to thousands of people, right? These, you need sales machines, mobile sales machines. Right? Very different. Because imagine these people need to find 1,000, 2,000, 10,000, 5,000 sales uh, people who are ready to buy this product from them. And that takes just lots of skills and experience in sales plus mobility, right? Same for the shifting cultivation model. You can take, you know, you should take people who are ideally professional salespeople or local people in some cases, but are very mobile. So forget about taking women, right? And these are people who are able to, you know, who are able to sell beyond their community. They are able to sell beyond their village. They are able to be away from home for weeks in a row. What happens when you take local people, villagers, to sell low-price low, low items? you end up in the purple bucket. That's why I'm very disappointed that so many of you chose that one because that was the only answer you could not choose. What happens when you take local people to sell a low, low price product? i tell you what happens. These people sell well at the beginning. They sell to their neighbor, their family, their friends, Sometimes they are motivated enough to go and knock on a couple of more doors. Perhaps they even reach out to the neighboring villages. And then what happens? It plateaus. They stop selling. Happens sometimes after one month. Sometimes happens after three months. Sometimes happens after six months. But at some point, they're the trust capital, right? They're their people capital, their social capital, is true. And they, don't, they cannot use it anymore, but they don't have the sales skills to do the skill, sale beyond the people they know. Right? 
So be very, very mindful of the gardening model. It is fine to use figures of authority to anchor your presence in a place, you know. If you call for, a, you know, a demo day, if you call for a health day, it is fine to do that under the blessing of the local chief, of the local mullah, of the local, you know. It is fine to do that. But as salespeople, <clears throat> if, your, if your items are low priced, a few dollars, then you need hunters. And there is the only way to do hunters is people who are able to sell your stuff day in, day out to whoever they cross in the street. Does it make sense? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I think it makes sense. Um, uh, as you have indicated, Lee, uh, in your explanation, I think we, we had an experience where we engage uh, uh, some uh, local agents and they, they just managed to sell those people who were close to them. And after that, then they did not know what else or who else to, to sell to. So what you are saying that is true. They will only sell to those people who are, are, are close to them. Yeah, because se selling stuff is a very uncomfortable job, right? If you're not a salesperson. Right? It's a very uncomfortable thing to do. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Any other thoughts on this? Brilliantly placed, uh, Jessica. Thank you. Okay. So we need to call it a day. I'm sorry. I'm so bad again. We didn't manage to finish the deck. We will need a... We have one more session about Salesforce retention. And then we have something about benchmarks. Uh, my question to you is when do we talk next? It will need to be the second half of August. Any no-goes in the week of 26th of August? Let's just make sure it's not a Monday again. Not a Monday. You don't like Mondays. That's fine. Tuesdays. Yes, should be on 27. 27, 9 to 11 Swiss time, which I have no idea what is the same time as, as today. Yes. Oh, that doesn't work. I got a call. Sorry. What about, uh, what about Wednesday 28? It's fine as well for us. Okay, I will send an invite for Wednesday 28, 9 to 11, same time as today. Great. Okay, okay. I will try to find some smart homework to keep you busy until then. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, yeah. Jessica, just one last quick one on the slide yeah. that you shared on the, um, on the benchmarking about the earnings versus the uh, deliveries of sales individuals. Was that like 20,000 benchmark versus 2,000 of uh, wages? Um, is this related to some developing country or a developed or an underdeveloped? No, it's like countries like we talk today, Africa, East Africa, okay. West Africa, Southern Asia. Okay. All right, because... But it's was, a bit old. It's a bit yeah, old. Yeah, because, because our average wage is, at, it sits around 4,500. 4, so that's where I was just thinking aloud. $4,500? Yes, yes. Mm. And they do 20, 35 in sales? They do about 30, 30. Yeah, they about 30,000 in sales, 30,000 to 35,000. Mm. 30,000 and growing, let's say that. Okay, so I think, uh, I think you're good. As long as you're above the bar, you're good. 
obviously you pay yeah, them above the bar in both the both the sides one is yeah exactly <laughs> so but on, on the other side above the bar is also not really good but i think the benchmarks are higher so that's where we should be targeting we should yeah raise, for sure raising the bar i i don't think you should lower how much you pay them right? yeah yeah that's not the criteria sure. You should Delivery. make sure you improve the sales productivity so it doesn't go below beyond the ten percent ideally. Absolutely. 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 Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank See you, you in, uh, in a few weeks. Sure. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye bye. Thank you. We'll, we'll like to sh if you can share these slides. Yeah, I will. The last one. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.